afternoon. My name is Courtney Baker, and I'm a rising junior at Ponders College in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And I'm pursuing a double major in chemistry and music. This summer, I spent my time in the Vegalo lab researching CO electrochemical reduction as part of the BCREU program. Now, first off, let me tell you a little bit about CO2. CO2, carbon dioxide, has become an increasing concern in our environment as we currently have about 37.1 gigatons emissions in our atmosphere. We can find a way to reduce this by looking at how CO2 is formed. CO2 is formed by the hydrocarbons and the combustion of hydrocarbons that converts it into CO2. We, what's really unique is we can reverse that process of CO2 and convert it back to hydrocarbons. The reason we're interested in this is because hydrocarbons are a large source of the world's fuel, and some examples are methane and gasoline. What the Vegola lab is interested in doing is using electrochemistry to solve this problem. <clears throat> we can use electrochemical reduction powered by potentially renewable energy as a sustainable way of converting CO2 to fuel. This serves the dual purpose of an, uh, addressing an environmental issue of rising CO2, as well as creating hydrocarbons which address the energy need that we have. Now, before I can get into why we're doing CO reduction, I need to first show you CO2 reduction. So CO2 reduces to CO, and the CO binds to the copper surface, and then you can further reduce CO to a variety of products. Whenever you reduce CO, it gives you a lot of different products that can be hydrocarbons and oxygenates, and as I told you previously, they can potentially be very valuable. The reason we chose copper as our surface is because of the unique binding energy of the carbon monoxide to the copper surface. This also is um, unique because that means that carbon monoxide doesn't bind so strongly to the copper that it's easily displaced, but it also doesn't bind so strongly that it's to find such that it's too strongly to the copper surface that you can't further reduce it. And then, I, as I said, there's some very valuable products. And then lastly, the mechanism of CO reduction, the CO portion of CO2 reduction. So for the mechanism of CO reduction, that still hasn't been determined on copper. And there's been some calculations, but no experimental evidence to provide support. And I'd like to emphasize that for the mechanism, that's really important because it can help us make more selective and active electrocatalysts, as well as tune our electrochemical setup. One other thing we had to keep in mind was hydrogen evolution, which is a competing reaction. I just showed you CO reduction, which you need CO plus water for CO reduction to occur. Well, that water could also participate in a hydrogen evolution reaction and form hydrogen. We found a way to circumvent that a little bit by using a special electrolyte called lithium TFSI. Lithium TFSI is very unique because there's about 3 grams of water which will dissolve a total of 20 grams of solid. That's really interesting and it means that the salt, lithium TFSI, is highly soluble in the water and we can do a concentration of up to 21 molar. In addition, since it reacts so strongly, we can tune the amount of water present in our system and reduce it such that there's not as much water enable, that would enable hydrogen evolution to occur. One other thing I'd like to emphasize is lithium TFSI has lithium, the cation, and then this portion of the structure, TFSI, is the anion. Just something to keep in mind because I'll be referencing anion later in my talk. For my chemical um, experimental setup, I first had to do a deposition of copper onto the silicon prism. And then the, it's a three electrode system, so the copper serves as the working electrode, and I also have a reference and a counter electrode. And then lastly, we use Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy to collect our data. This is a, what Seth previously just mentioned, but a brief overview is you shine infrared light into the experimental setup, and different chemicals will absorb light at different frequencies. One really unique thing about our setup is we use ATR, which is attenuated total reflectance, and this is a silicon ATR prism in which the IR beam goes into the prism and hits some copper at an angle such that it reflects right back out. 
The first thing that we noticed was whenever we looked at our FTIR data, this is plotting adsorbents, milli-OD, against frequency. And as you see, this starts at negative 0.5, and it goes to a more negative potential of negative 1.5. As we go to a more negative potential, we have the presence of carbon monoxide. And we expected to see that because we're approaching CO in our system. That's at 2100. And then we also have our anion at 1350. That's what I mentioned earlier about the electrolyte. The anion at 1350 is really interesting because that was a much larger peak than we expected. So we then conducted the experiment in argon without any CO purging. And we saw, of course, no CO because there is no CO present in the system, but we still saw the anion peak. The unique thing was the anion was much smaller than it was in CO. That meant that there must have been some coordination between the CO adsorbents and reduction with the anion. And therefore, the anion might be playing a role in CO reduction. One thing that further supported this was whenever we looked at the integrated band area. This shows the total coverage as we go more positive of the surface and it's against potential. So we're going from a positive, more positive to a more negative potential. Right here, this pink line is the anion plotted against the CO. As we initially conducted the experiment, there was an increase of both the anion and the CO before there was a sudden decrease in the presence of the anion while the CO continued to increase. This initial increase of the anion further indicated that the anion might be playing a role in CO reduction. One other interesting thing that we noticed was the onset of our peak for CO coverage when conducted in the water and salt. So this is the normalized band area, which is the total CO coverage as we go more positive against potential. And this is in 21 molar water and salt. So this is the onset of the CO coverage maximum and then the decline. You can see that it, the maximum of CO coverage is about negative one. And then we compared this to carbonate data that we had previously collected and saw that this onset was at a later potential and so was the maximum in the decline. We wanted to be sure about this data so we also conducted it in hydroxide solution and we saw the same trend of a later onset max and decline of CO coverage. And so this indicated that the water and salt allows for an earlier max of CO coverage on our copper surface, as well as a earlier decline. And this could imply one, two different things. We could either be having the earlier onset of CO reduction of hydrocarbons, or there could be some blocking of the CO sites on our copper surface during the decline, and that could prevent CO from binding. One other thing that we noticed was a change in frequency of our uh, CO signal. And so this is, again, FTR data of adsorbents against frequency, and this is specifically the CO peak. And you can see right here, this blue signal is the 0.1 molar, a very low concentration of our water and salt plotted against 15 molar and 21 molar. There is a increase in the frequency as we go to more concentrated solutions, and this increase in the frequency could indicate there's a stronger binding strength of CO to our copper surface as we go more concentrated solutions, but that's not pos entirely positive data because there were some environmental differences, as well as considering that 21 molar has a lot less water than the 0.1 molar, so that could also account for this, and it might not mean the binding strength increased. But overall, we learned quite a lot. There's definitely some anion and CO coabsorption occurring, as well as the early onset and decline of the water and salt, and then increased binding strength might be occurring or it might not be. I'd like to thank the BCREU program and NSF for making this research possible, as well as Dr. Matthias Vegula for providing such a wonderful lab to work in, and Vincent Oval, my mentor, who helped me along the way with a lot of different things, and the entire Vegula lab, who answered my many questions and provided a lot of support. Previously, actually done some on gold, 
for uh, CO reduction on coal, well, we did CO2, but um, we ultimately decided to go with copper because we were interested in the onset and decline of the CO absorption. So we might go back to gold or look at some other metals in the future, but we were particularly interested in that trend right now and we're still exploring it further. Question. So, is the is the if I understood it right, the stronger binding with more of the anion? Uh, not a chance. Is that in the end not helpful because you work? You might worry about then if you can then further work. to then further convert it. Would be difficult. Um, so the stronger binding strength of the CO to the copper surface, it could be. Potentially good. It depends on how strong the normal binding is of CO to copper. So if it's um, if it does become too strong of a strength that of binding strength, then that could prevent further reduction of hydrocarbons. That is true. Um, 